We sing because why? In the song we say, we sing because I'm happy. And this summer, we are having an entire series through the Psalms. I sing because I'm, right? And as you just heard from Cassie, as she was so wonderfully reading Psalm 137, you can hear the despair dripping off of every line. This is not one of those happy psalms that you go to when you just need a good pick-me-up, right? This is a psalm of despair. So the question we are going to be asking today is how can we sing because I'm despairing, right? Not, not sing in spite of our feelings or emotions, but how can we sing because we have that emotion, right? We're going into the Psalms to say, these are God's words. This is what he has already said is okay. And we read the psalmist say such things like that. Are they allowed to say that? They were. So what can we learn from this? So um, before I forget, scattered around the room, if you did not grab one of the bookmarks, um, we printed those out for you. We're trying to, as a church, read through the Psalms for the summer. And we started this two weeks ago. So if you started when we started, you're going to be around Psalm 28, I think, generally in that range. If you didn't start, I promise you, we have 150 to go. You have plenty of time to catch up. This is about two psalms a day. So grab that bookmark. If you didn't, you can use it as a checklist. Kind of check it off as you are going. Um, read with us. Be encouraged with us. All right, so Psalm 137. This is probably one of the biggest, that's in the Bible type psalms that exists. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it talks about despair. Okay, so what's despair? Despair is a complete lack of hope. Hopelessness. It's seeing no beneficial or positive end in sight. It's feeling like you are stuck, stuck in awful, and you can't get out. And that's where you are. All right, so what are despairing situations that you might find yourself in? I, I'm, these are the ones that came to mind. They are by no means limiting. Medical bills piling up higher than you have the funds to pay them. Might find yourself as a married couple desperate for children, and yet God has not blessed you with that. Or God has blessed you with children, and you may have lost them before. Despair. Maybe, maybe you are being treated so awfully where you work, where you live, where you play, that you don't see an end in sight, that when you show up there, you know this is going to be torture. Maybe you're working for a change in your marriage, in family relationships, in friendships, in, in addictions you're fighting, in bad habits you're fighting, and you are working, and you are working, and you are working, and all you are feeling is regression, it's not going anywhere. There's no hope here. So what comes to mind for you? What comes to mind for you when you think of despair? If you do feel right now that you are in despair, please understand it is okay to feel that. It is okay to feel that. Please don't feel shame and that not everything is together. I don't want to even blow through this list of suggestions such that if you found yourself on the list, it was like, well, he hit that bullet point and then he just ran right on forward. It's okay. It's okay to feel seen here because we sing because we are despairing. Here is the hope that I hope to send you with when we walk out of here. 
When I'm despairing, I will remember that the God of justice reigns supreme. When I'm despairing, I will remember that the God of justice reigns supreme. All right, so let's jump back into the text, Psalm 137, verse 1. Okay, for our first four verses, here's the thing that will guide us. We remember. We remember. Verse 1, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Now, to understand anything that is happening in this passage, we need to understand a little bit of context. So this was written in about 587, 586 BC. The Israelites have been sent out of their land, taken out of their land, and they have been taken into exile by the Babylonians, okay? Why? Why were the Israelites captured? taken from their land. Go with me, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 19 through 22. Now, this is God talking to King Solomon at the dedication of the temple many, many, many years before this. If you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you, and you go and you serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you and this house that I have consecrated for my name and I will cast out of my sight and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house, which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them, therefore he has brought this disaster on them. So to be clear, they brought this on themselves. The Israelites are being punished for rejecting God. They have been ripped from their homeland, and they have been put in enemy territory. So this phrase, by the the waters of Babylon, it very well could be locational, right? So like the psalmists, where were they? By the waters of Babylon. Duh, they told us. However, when, because this is poetry, water, when it is used in this era, it's, it's polar. It's either going to be a really good thing or it's going to be a really bad thing. By the waters of Babylon is a bad thing. Think, think Red Sea, right? Israelites running for freedom. They've been freed and now they're coming to the edge of this sea. It is its end. There is no hope. They can't go any further. Why, God, why? That is the type of water we are talking about here. By the waters of Babylon, there is no hope. There is only despair. So at this shore, despair wells up. See, that is a happy cry. I am good with that. I love that. See, happy Father's Day to you, Michael. <laughs> um, they cried for different reasons. Okay, so, so their tears well up, but they well up with despair, right? Their remembering Zion brought sadness, okay? What's Zion? All right, Zion is Jerusalem. This is the capital that they come from. It is their homeland, but not only is Zion their homeland. Zion, Jerusalem, this is the place that God chose to put his temple. This is the place that God chose to say, I am going to reside with you. You can commune with me. So when they are remembering Zion, it is not just a place, but it is God. It is his favor. It is his ways. It is his covenant. When they think of Zion, 
they are thinking about everything connected to God Almighty. Imagine feeling that every avenue that you had of connection to God was ripped away. That's despair. And that is their general mood that they are writing from. Verse 2. On the willows there we hung up our lyres. Those are instruments to play. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. Uh, this could be called the insult to injury portion of the text. They have now been ripped from their homeland and are now being told, hey, play for us a little ditty from way back where you came from. All right. So again, as a reminder, Zion is not equal to, but is connected with God. So a song of Zion is a song extolling the virtues and the goodness of God. And so they say, come, entertain us with one of those silly songs about your God. You know, the one that didn't come and help you. The one that exiled you with us. This, this was a level of demand that they couldn't even stomach. I, I was trying to figure out what's an analogy that I can have us kind of see a little bit of resonance with. It's like taking Handel's Messiah and making it background music for an online sports betting app, okay? Like, that's gross, right? That's, that's the level of gross. You would listen to that and say, oh, ooh, something's not right there, okay? Now take that and amplify it way more. That's where Israel finds themselves. So the psalm singers, they say, we refuse to be psalm singers. You awake? Okay. The request was so awful, they said no more. I mean, they took their instruments, broke them, hung them up, we're done. We will not entertain our captors with our songs praising the Lord. We will not stoop that low. Verse 4. How, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? This verse four is like the central lament. Everything is built around. Okay, so this first word, how, all the commentaries I read, this is not like a checklist, like, excuse me, how do we go about singing the Lord's song in a foreign, foreign land? Can you tell us how we go about that? We'll make sure to take notes, check boxes. No, this is a deep soul level emotion. How? How? The despair is even dripping in a single word. How? No. Do you see how they changed? They said, how can we sing the Lord's song? They were demanded to sing a song of Zion. They know this is a song to the Lord. How will we sing Yahweh's words of goodness? here in this foreign land. And lastly, I actually, my notes are wrong as I was rereading it. I think this is the fourth or the fifth there that we have seen. All right. Verse one, there we sat down. Verse two, on the willows there. Verse three, for there our captors re required songs of us. Verse four, in a foreign land, even if you want to put by the waters of Babylon, it is there. It's like an accusatory there. I don't think that's a thing in English. But there, there, there. And what do you hear with each of these fingers pointing there? Despair, despair, despair. Has your despair ever followed a similar path where your situation brings salty tears to your eyes just to think about it have you ever felt injustice grow well up deep within you because you are longing for a home that's nothing like this 
a place that's whole, a place that is peace, as it should always be. See, these first four verses are in a plural, right? The despair comes in first person plural, so we, we remember. Verses five and six change to a first person singular, so now it's I remember. So we start with we remember, and then it goes to I remember. Verse five, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. The literal translation is, if I forget, let my hand forget. If I forget, let my hand forget. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. In this oath, the underlying claim is I remember. It's phrased, if I forget, but he's not forgetting because he's saying it or they are saying it, okay? So if I forget, and I don't forget, let the ability that I have existed for before now, where I sing praises to God, where I use my skill to play songs to him, if I forget him, let me never sing again. Let me never play again. Let me be silent. If, and this is the big if, if God above, Yahweh, Lord most high, is not my highest joy. If I go to anyone or anything else to take your place, God, let me never sing. Let me never play to you again. Now remember, in verses 1 through 6, we've got we remember and I remember. In despair, in agony, what they are doing is they are reminding God of their relationship with him. In a way, this is like verses 1 through 6 are like a repentance. They have been sent into exile because they have forgotten God. And as they sit on the shores of Babylon, they say, God, we have not forgotten you. We remember. I remember. I talked with a friend this week, and he just dropped gold, and I had to write it down. Despair pushes us to the promises of God. Pastor D'Amico, uh, Sojourn Southside. Such wisdom. Despair pushes us to the promises of God. When we despair, because we will, when we despair, the surest place to go is to the side of our righteous and just God. We don't turn to others to fix our mess. We don't turn to half measures that are not going to heal us all the way. We go straight to our king. We go straight to our king because he reigns supreme. He has the power and he has the position to act. Now, remember, despair pushes us to the promises of God. Our writers here, they remember the verses that precede the curse uh, that came to them, that if they rejected God, they would be sent into exile. They remember what came before this. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. And then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, don't turn your iPad and then have it blank out. Okay. He appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house 
that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. Verses 1 through 6 are the Israelites leaning to God and saying, we remember the promises that you made to us. So what's the other half of that coin? God, do you remember? Do you remember your people? Do you remember your promises? Do you remember? Because if you do, be righteous, be just, and act. So our last section of verses is you remember, we remember, I remember. But if it helps you, you remember. It's that accusatory there, <laughs> looking straight at God. We've moved from claims, we remember, I remember, to commands. I mean, this is an imperative here. The words that here are here. Verse 7, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem. How they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. Historically speaking, Edomites likely helped Babylon sack Israel. So the Edomites said, hey, come on this way, come on this way, you can kill them this way. And the Israelites said, Lord, you saw that. Remember their actions. Verse 8, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Now this comes in pairs. Blessed shall be he who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. Now, I bet a lot of you are questioning me as a person for covering these verses at all with children present. I am not unaware. Why is this so graphic? Why is this so violent? So this psalm, and specifically this section of the psalm, this is an imprecatory psalm. So kids, if you have your little note sheets and you've been coloring, just go for trying to write that word, imprecatory. I think we did put it up there, so you can just copy. All right, an imprecatory psalm calls on God directly to bring down his holy wrath, his righteous judgment on those who commit injustice. Okay, so this isn't like somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're super annoyed and you say, Lord, rain down your fire on that person who cut me off. All right. The psalmists are trying to convey the broken stuff needs to be made whole. The wrongs need to be made right. And that God, the one who is just and righteous, he needs to bring justice. And so they are calling on God to rain down only that which he can, right? It, it throws back to God, Psalm 89, 14a, just the start of this verse. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. So God, if that's true... Remember, remember. Now, I do want to make note, which you see in, at the end of, well, with verse 8 and with verse 9, like I said, it comes in pairs. So that first one is, Lord, repay them for the evil that they have done. And then it lists the evil. The psalmists, I don't think, are sitting by the waters of Babylon and thinking of the most awful things that they can write. These are things that were done to them. These are things that were done to their people. And so they say, Lord, satisfy the wrong. The person who does this, the, the phrase uh, blessed be or happy is, isn't really getting across. It's, it's more like content, like I am going to strive to have something 
something that was wrong righted, and when it is righted, I am done striving. Okay, so content, satisfied. That's what they are calling for, for God to repay. Repay. I had this in my notes. I took it out, but I think it's fun. So the, the Hebrew word for repay is uh, yes, salem. Yes, salem. Um, for those who actually know Hebrew, please do not judge me. So yes, salem is the word for repay. repay. And the root word for Jerusalem is Yerusalem. Yes, salem, Yerusalem repay for Jerusalem. It's a play on words that has been built into this. God repay for what has been judged. Do only what you can do. Remember, remember, remember. So the psalmists have taken their despair and they've gone straight to God. And I don't want this to be missed. They have taken their despair and they have gone straight to God because they know that the God of justice is the only thing, the only one who can do anything and bring lasting hope. Now, let's look back in history. Did he? I mean, this is an actual prayer for God to actually move. It's not a fake scenario. Did God move? He did. About 70-ish years late, well, no, Sometime in the near future, the Medo-Persians came and they wiped out the Babylonians. Smashed them to bits. Babylonians never to reign again. Medo-Persians then became the Persians. Persians sent Israel back to Israel about 70 years after they were taken. So, hooray, right? The prayer was heard. The people got to go back to the land. And when they arrived, did they say, This is great, joy everlasting. They said, this is horrible. Jerusalem has been ransacked. The temple has been demolished. Our city doesn't have any walls. Lord, we cried out to be returned, but what's this? They were happy that their prayers were answered. They were happy that they were back. And they yearn for the fullness of God's promises to come because something was lacking. The greatest promise yet still, a savior. Fast forward about 500 years. Jesus of Nazareth came. He was the only one who could actually bring the justice that Israel longed for. And not just Israel, but for all of us. When Jesus went to the cross, to make all things new, he absolutely heard and he did remember the sins of the Edomites, the sins of the Babylonians, the sins of the Israelites, and the sins of all mankind, all humanity for all time everywhere. He took it and he was that covenant sacrifice because God did say, he answered with, yes, I do remember. I do remember. And I myself am coming to be sacrificed for you so that you will be made whole, so that justice will be done, so that righteousness can be seen. It is here. And it is only through Jesus. Now, I bet if you are tracking along, I know most of you. I know you're smart. And so you're probably tracking along and say, that's real great, Andrew. You're telling me Jesus came and he brought justice. He brought righteousness. It was enough. We have access to it. So why in the heck am I in despair right now? Why is there injustice all over the world? Why is slavery right now a bigger deal where more people numerically in slavery now than there were during the transatlantic slave trade. Please tell me, if Jesus has fixed it all, why ain't it fixed? Okay. Because Jesus brought the new creation and he is bringing the new creation. 
Jesus did bring hope, and he is still bringing hope. Okay, so what's, what's a real world example that can maybe, that we can relate to? Tomorrow, if you have been paying attention to the calendar, is Juneteenth, Freedom Day. I just wanna raise the hands. Who knows what Juneteenth is? Just by a show of hands. Okay, Megan and I were having a nice little confession time yesterday and I was like, I didn't know what Juneteenth was until I got to Houston. And I'm 40 and we've been here almost eight years. So I had no idea what Juneteenth was. So for those who didn't have hands raised, June 19th, 1865, on the shores of Galveston, Texas, Union soldiers led by Major General Gordon Granger arrived and declared to everybody that the Emancipation Proclamation had been issued that all slaves were free. He arrived on June 19th, 1865, and the Emancipation Proclamation was issued by Lincoln on January 1st, 1863. It took two and a half years for that information of freedom to make it to Texas. So, did the Emancipation Proclamation free all of the enslaved people? Yes. Did everybody know it? No. Okay. To those enslaved, Juneteenth, that announcement was an answer to their tear-stained prayers for decades and decades. They were free. They were already free, and now that they hear that news of their freedom, they are taking steps to it. And I know, you know, church is the place you want to be happy. The reality is, Juneteenth happened. And people found out they were free. Enslaved people were free. And did that mean they were automatically everything free? Nope. Because a bunch of other people were not happy that they were free. And they enacted laws and and changed things to make the enslaved people like they were still enslaved even though they weren't. So they were free, but they didn't actually have real freedom. The injustice was still around them. So, when we look back and we see Juneteenth, does that mean that it doesn't count? Like that freedom wasn't real just because it wasn't fully and immediately achieved? No. No. Juneteenth should be celebrated. Tomorrow should be a great party. And especially here in Houston, y'all, they came to the shores of Galveston. We are the nearest real big city. Juneteenth is a big deal here in Houston. If you didn't know that, I invite you to go to Freedmanstown. Go just down the road. Learn. Learn about Reverend Yates. Learn about Emancipation Park. Learn what Juneteenth has been in the city of Houston. That's like an assignment, right? That's not even a call to action. Just, just remember that, note that, Take after it. You can do so tomorrow. But the existence of Juneteenth should remind us that justice has come and it's still a process. Injustice still must be rooted out. Okay? The the new creation that Jesus initiated, he did bring it. It is here. It has come. But it is also still in process, and he has invited us to participate in bringing that newness. It has come, and he's invited us to participate in that newness. So, what do we do when we despair? Despair pushes us to the promises of God. If you despair, run to the side of our righteous and just God. This passage is tricky because their specific situation was brought on by their sin. 
the despair that you are feeling may not be because of your sin. It might be out of your control. But whether your despairing situation is connected to your responsibility or not, there is a single, single person to go to. And it's God Almighty. Now, our God of justice remembers. Okay, so for our call to action, there's, there's going to be three, and they're going to go with the passage. So I remember, I remember that God is a God of justice. So here, and, and a God who fulfills promises. So here's my call to action for you. Um, after you Google history of Juneteenth, the next thing you can throw into Google is promises of God in scripture. And I want you, there are so many websites that have all of these things listed, gobs of promises, things that you need to remember. Take a look at them. Things like Jesus promising that he is here to make all things new. Him reminding us that he has come, he has overcome the world. Take these things, read through them, and then find one that you know you need to remember this week. Write it on a post-it note. Take a dry erase marker and put it on your mirror. Note that it's dry erase before you write. But write that above your mirror and remind yourself this week of one of the promises of God that you need to hold on to. Remember that he is a God of justice. Second thing, we remember. We remember that the God of justice reigns supreme. And so this one's difficult to say, but my encouragement is for you to get in action towards justice with others. Whether that means you want to volunteer with one of the anti-trafficking organizations that our church is connected to, like Demand Disruption, like The Landing, even with Freedom Church Alliance, get more info personally, or here's my encouragement, grab some others. Remember, it's we, we, we remember. Grab some others and say, if we have been made free and called to bring that freedom, then let's get after that. We are the foretaste of the goodness of God brought to this world. You, me, the church, us together, we are the foretaste. People are going to understand who God is and what he does when, he look, when they look at us. So when you're out solo, they're going to know. Go out as a big group. Go out and say, we are a changed people who represent a new kingdom that bring the good news of this kingdom. Aim to see God's justice brought in this world. So I remember, we remember, and lastly, you remember. Go to God. My, my word and my encouragement to you, pray. Pray. Pray God's words back to him. Lord, you said that you would step in. Lord, you said that you would be by my side. Lord, you said you would bring newness. I don't feel it. I don't see it. Lord, be near. So, write down a promise of God. Join others in the work of justice and go to our king and pray his promises back to him. I remember, we remember, God, you remember that you are a God of justice who meets us in our despair. Would you all pray with me?